Um, so welcome everyone uh, to our talk. Uh, today we have uh, Professor Ben Atcock from uh, Simon Fraser University um, to give a talk here. Just a few words um, from his CV, I guess. He has done his uh, academic education in, in the UK at the University of Cambridge uh, with Ariel Isales, um, finished his PhD in 2011, then came to Canada as an NSEC and PIMS postdoc um, to SFU. Uh, then had a short sort of pit stop, I guess, in the United States of Purdue University until coming back to Canada and quickly rising through the ranks I've seen um, from assistant to associate and finally full professor at Simon Fraser. Um, several prizes that he received, so I'm, I'm really quite pleased that he agreed to talk uh, in our seminar today. Um, that's all from my side and uh, today um, I guess you, you, you can start now. Thank you. Great. Um, so thank you very much, Alex. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's, uh, it's really nice to be talking across the country today. Uh, and uh, it's also very nice to hear about the sort of uh, the activities around data science that are going on uh, uh, on the, uh, the Atlantic, uh, in the Atlantic provinces. Um, so I'm, I'm glad to have this opportunity to speak here today. Uh, so my talk is um, uh, really about the topic of high dimensional approximation. Um, this has actually been a, a subject quite close to my heart since I was a PhD student. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of quite happy that I can sort of talk here today about um, the sort of work that we've been doing in, in high dimensional approximation for the last um, uh, nearly, nearly a decade now. So. Uh, this talk is essentially divided into two two parts. Um, the first part, first two thirds of the talk, roughly about polynomial methods for high dimensional approximation, and then the last third is going to be about sort of more recent approaches in based on deep neural networks. So um, let me there we go. Let me get started. So first of all, before I um, I begin the talk, uh, let me just mention that this is work with a bunch of collaborators uh, and students and postdocs. Uh, I've been very lucky at my time at SFU to have uh, excellent students uh, who have helped uh, push this work forwards um, to the stage where it is today. Uh, so let me mention uh, Annie Bao, uh, who's a former uh, undergraduate student, uh, Juan Cardenas, who's a current PhD student. Nick Dexter is my, my postdoc. Uh, he's currently on the job market. If anyone uh, has a position in data science, he uh, would certainly be interested. Uh, Sebastian Moraga uh, is a PhD student of mine, and Yi Sui is a former PhD student. Um, outside of that, there are two, two key collaborators on this work. Uh, Simone Bruciapaglia, uh, who's uh, an assistant professor at Concordia now, uh, is also my former postdoc. Uh, and Clayton Webster, who is uh, at the University of Texas. Um, so Simone, Clayton and I are actually uh, just finishing uh, a book uh, called Sparse Polynomial Approximation of High Dimensional Functions, uh, which is due to appear um, hopefully by the end of this year um, with Cyan. So if you're interested in the sort of material in the first two thirds of the talk, um, I uh, would highly recommend this, this book to you. Okay, so let's uh, let's get started. So as I said, this talk is going to be in sort of um, two main parts. Uh, the first two thirds are roughly sort of polynomial approximation techniques for high dimensional approximation, um, and we'll talk about sparse polynomial approximations. And our primary tool that we're going to use is is compressed sensing techniques. Uh, then in the final one third of the talk, I want to talk about sort of our, our more recent work our most recent work in uh, approximation uh, using deep neural networks. So let's get started. So uh, first of all, let me start with the motivation. So um, uh, the motivation for this work comes from uh, parametric models and parametric modeling. So broadly speaking, I'm, uh, oh, sorry. Trying to find my my cursor, but it seems to have disappeared. Sorry about that. Okay, can you see my cursor? By the way. Uh, yes. Okay, great. 
So, um, so I'm interested in, in parametric model problems. So we are interested in understanding how the parameters in some kind of physical model uh, affect its output. So the physical model could be some kind of weather or climate model, uh, a chemical or a biological process, um, some epidemiological model or something like that. But generally speaking, we're just going to think of a model where we have a vector parameters. These could be either uh, deterministic or they could be stochastic. We feed them into some black box, um, which evaluates our model and gives us an output uh, f of y. And this is some, some quantity of interest of the model that we're interested in. So the sort of broad goal um, that I'm interested in is um, what is often termed surrogate modeling, okay? which is to construct an approximation uh, of this physical model from sample values, from snapshots. So in other words, we'd like to approximate f using a small number of sample values, f of y1, dot, 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 through to f of ym. Why do this? Well, generally speaking, it's expensive to evaluate this model. Uh, every time you, you feed an input into this black box, this either requires some kind of physical experiment or more commonly some large scale computer simulation to generate your output f of y. So the idea of surrogate modeling is to construct an approximation of your, your model. So you model the model, in other words, uh, and then you can work with the surrogate model. So perhaps if you have stochastic parameters, you want to do some kind of uncertainty quantification. Uh, you might also want to do param parameter optimization to so optimize your function f um, with respect to its parameters. Or maybe you want to solve inverse parametric problems, okay? Uh, given an output f of y, determine uh, the input parameters. Okay? And the idea is, is you first approximate your model um, with a surrogate, and then you, you can perform these tasks more easily. Okay, so this is, um, this is a, a very well-known problem, uh, a very important problem, um, but it's also a very challenging problem. Uh, and I'd like to highlight sort of four key challenges which are really gonna be the focal point of this work. So the first is that the dimension of this problem is, is generally very high, okay? So if you have a complex model, it involves many parameters. So on the order of tens or hundreds or potentially even more. Formally, um, we'll talk about this a little bit more uh, later in the talk, uh, the dimension could be even infinite, okay? So you could um, have a model where the, there are infinitely many parameters, accountability only. Secondly, generating data is expensive. Uh, as I've mentioned, every time you want to um, uh, probe your black box, uh, this involves either physical experiments or more commonly an expensive computer simulation. Thirdly, the data is always corrupted by errors. Okay? So there's random noise in physical measurements. There are modeling errors, um, uh, discretization errors, or numerical errors. At any time you, you take your, your physical model and you write a computer code to, uh, to evaluate it. Fourth and finally, the model actually, the output of the model might be function space value. So in other words, f of y, um, sometimes it might be scalar valued, may also be vector valued, but in general, it could take values in a function space as well. I'll talk about the reasons for this more in a second. Okay, so um, just to, to sort of uh, crystallize things a little bit further, let me talk about sort of an important class of uh, parametric model problems. Um, and this is so-called parametric differential equations. So um, often we, some parametric model, we formulate as a system of differential equations um, involving parameters. So in other words, we think of a uh, solution U, um, which depends on physical variables X, so spatial variables and possibly including time, uh, and parametric variables Y. Right? And this is a solution of some differential equation that depends on the parameters. Okay? So um, this L subscript Y is an operator, depending on the parameters Y, that defines your differential equation. So then we, we typically call the object y maps to u of y, uh, the parametric solution map. So here we can see that this is generally a uh, function space value. Okay? This is a function of x for each 
fixed value of y. Um, and so sometimes, depending on the problem, we might want to compute the whole parametric solution map. But in other problems, we might want to compute some kind of scalar quantity of interest of this. So for instance, we might be interested in the, uh, the average value of u uh, over the physical variables, for instance. This would give us a scalar quantity of interest uh, depending on y only. Or we might be interested in uh, u evaluated at some fixed point uh, in our physical domain. So, uh, and there are various other quantities of interest we could consider. We might consider the energy of the solution or something like that. Okay, so just to, um, just to make things even more specific, let me um, give a very uh, particular example. So this is um, the sort of fruit fly example uh, in um, the parametric DE uh, world, and this is a, a parametric uh, elliptic diffusion equation. Okay? So this talk is not really about applications, so this is a very simple model for porous media flow. Um, so in this problem, we have our uh, standard elliptic diffusion equation, and the parametric dependence uh, is through the diffusion coefficient. So this depends on uh, the spatial variable x and the parametric variable y. And there are different ways in which you might um, uh, describe your, your diffusion. Um, the, the simplest one is to have some kind of affine diffusion. So you have A of X and Y is some series expansion where the Y, J are the coefficients in this expansion uh, and you have some basis functions Psi, J of X. So a particular example of this is when you, when you consider a random field in which case this, uh, this would be the Cahoon and Love expansion of the random field. So in that case, you, you naturally come, you naturally obtain a problem with inf depending on countably many parameters because this expansion is formally an infinite expansion. Uh, there are various other uh, standard forms for the, the diffusion coefficient. So uh, for instance, you could have log, a log normal coefficient. So you have a, the exponential of a sum over your parametric variables uh, multiplied by by some basis functions psi j as well. Okay, so just to just to sort of emphasize what the, the setup is here. Um, so we think we have our input y, which is our vector parameters, which may be infinite. We, in the case of a parametric diffusion equation, we generate a diffusion coefficient um, uh, at these parameter values. Then we feed this into some kind of black box PDE solver uh the, how this is done is not the focus of the talk at all we assume that we have some um some existing code that can do this and this spits out an output uh you um uh depending on the spatial variable x uh at the whatever par parametric variable we fed in here Okay, so let me let me point out this is this is sort of the uh, as I said this is the fruit fly example there are many sort of generalizations of this problem. So parabolic parametric PDEs, hyperbolic parametric PDEs. You can have PDEs over where the parametric dependence uh, is in the shape of the domain here, omega. So it's some parametrization of the domain. You can have parametric initial value problems. There, there are all, all sorts of different families of parametric differential equations that one can sort of consider. Okay, so to sort of summarize where we're where we've got to at this point um so we have a high dimensional uh function f that might be function space valued so let me just emphasize here this mapping for a uh, your scalar input oh so your vector input y gives you a uh, an output that lives in a function space okay. um so this function is, uh, so the input is high dimensional, could formally be infinite dim uh, dimensional. And we know that generally speaking, generating a lot of data is gonna be expensive, okay? So we, every time we want to sample our, uh, our mapping, we have to do a black box PDE solve. So on the face of it, it, it looks very challenging to, to devise some kind of approximation uh, to this function from a small number of sample values. Um, fortunately, there's, there's one key element that's going to make these kinds of problems tractable. Um, and this, 
key observation is that for large classes of parametric models, in particular parametric uh, differential equations, the solution map, so the mapping from y to u of y, uh, is a smooth function. Okay? It's uh, more specifically, it's a holomorphic function or an analytic function uh, with respect to the parametric variables. So this is the observation that's going to motivate the first part of the talk, which is on using polynomial methods. So if we have a smooth function of our variables, then it's a seemingly very natural choice to use some type of polynomial approximation scheme. Okay, let me, let me just point out one thing here before we go any further. So um, the, the solution of the PDE is uh, not particularly smooth in, with respect to the physical variable. So for each fixed Y, it's generally an H10 if we consider a, an elliptic um, diffusion equation. What, what I'm saying here is that the mapping from Y to U of Y is holomorphic. So it's holomorphic in the variables Y. It's, we're not assuming smoothness uh, with respect to this, uh, the physical variables here. Okay, so I should also point out so that there's a large collection of literature showing these kind of analyticity uh, or holomorphy results for parametric PDEs. So um, I won't go into any of the details. This, this sort of research started around 10, 15 years ago um, with uh, works of Cohen, DeVore and Schwab uh, and various others. Um, and so there's, a, there's now the sort of large classes of parametric DEs that have been identified that have this this type of this type of property this holomorphic property okay so with that in mind um the rest of the talk is as follows so uh the first part of the talk will discuss polynomial methods so what we're going to do here is we're going to reinterpret smoothness uh it, as sparsity or approximate sparsity of the polynomial coefficient so we're going to expand our function in some orthonormal basis and then smoothness will naturally be related to sparsity of the coefficients in that basis. This means that we can use ideas from sparse recovery um, to approximate the function. In particular, we can use compressed sensing ideas and we're going to combine that with uh, sampling schemes that we know work well in high dimensions and specifically Monte Carlo sampling. Um, and then we'll discuss how this, how this approach works in practice and how it can overcome uh, a number of these challenges or the, the extent to which it overcomes these challenges. Then the, the final third of the talk is, uh, is about deep neural network approximation methods. Um, so I'll, I'll try and discuss the extent to which um, sort of more recent DNN based methods can at least theoretically and numerically outperform uh, some of these uh, compressed sensing based polynomial methods. Okay, um, are, there any, are there any questions before I get started? So feel free if there are questions to, um, to post them in the chat or, um, or uh, raise your hand or whatever. So. Okay, so let me, um, let me move on to uh, polynomial approximation. So, okay, so um, I clearly did not edit this slide. So, um, uh, so this slide is from a previous talk. Uh, so I said, since it is late in the day, because the previous talk was late in the day. So change this to uh, since it's early in the morning. Um, and apologies for not changing that slide. So um, we could, uh, to make things a little bit more, um, straightforward, we're going to make a number of assumptions now um, just to simplify the problem a little bit. Um, much of what I say can be done more generally, um, but the details become sort of rather more technical. So um, for most of what uh, of the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus on the function approximation problem itself. So I'm not going to assume necessarily that F is a solution of a parametric differential equation. All I'm going to assume is that f is a uh, is a holomorphic function um, of its variables. 
I'm also going to make life a little simpler and consider just scalar valued functions. Um, I'll, I'll return briefly to the case of um, uh, function space valued functions. Um, and I'm also going to assume that our domain, um, so the, uh, the domain from which our, uh, our variables uh, y come is the, um, is the q minus 1, 1 to the d. Okay, so um, this assumption is, um, uh, is common in practice. Um, there, there are definitely problems where this is not valid. Uh, I'll, if there's time, I'll say a little bit more about this later in the talk. Um, but we're going to assume uh, that we work on the, on essentially the uh, a unit cube in D dimensions. Okay, and finally, um, it, when we're working with polynomial approximations, uh, we're going to consider expansions in either Chebyshev or Legendre polynomials. Right? Um, but as I said, and let me emphasize again, a lot of what I've said here does extend to to more general settings. Um, uh, with more technical details, and in the in the final two bullet points, uh, with there are some extensions, although the the guarantees aren't as strong in general. Okay, so um, so let's let's now consider polynomial approximations. So um, we all learn about orthogonal polynomials in a numerical analysis class. Um, in on uh, the unit interval. So let's suppose that uh, we're in one dimension for the moment. Uh, we have an orthonormal polynomial basis uh, with respect to some uh, measure nu, which throughout the talk we'll assume is a probability measure. Um, and in particular, we'll focus on the following two cases. So either um, nu will be the uniform measure uh, which will give us the Legendre polynomials, or it'll be the arc sine measure, which will give us the Chebyshev polynomials. And just note here, I've normalized my measures so that they're both, both probability measures. Then, um, any function f um, that's uh, in L2 nu, uh, we know that we can, uh, it, we know that it has an orthogonal expansion in this basis. Okay, so we can write f as a sum uh, from n equals zero to infinity over coefficient cn times by our basis functions, okay, where the cn are just the inner products of f with the basis functions. And this should be a new here, not a, not a row. Okay, so um, in one dimensions, um, if we assume our function is holomorphic, then there's a classical story about polynomial approximation of, of analytic or holomorphic functions. Uh, and this is the following. So the, if the, it turns out that the right regions to consider for polynomial approximation are so-called Bernstein ellipses. Uh, so if we suppose that F has a holomorphic extension to a Bernstein ellipse, so um, a Bernstein ellipse, uh, if, if you haven't seen it before, is uh, an ellipse in the complex plane. Uh, its focal points are plus one and minus one. So they're the end points of the interval that we're, we're interested in. Uh, and it's defined by a parameter rho. Uh, and the parameter rho is, is greater than one and is this determines the major and minor semi-axis lengths. So the major semi-axis length is rho plus one over rho divided by two, and the minor semi-axis length is rho minus one over rho over two. So if we assume that F has a holomorphic extension to this, this complex region, then the, its coefficients with respect to this basis uh, look like rho to the negative n, okay, up to some algebraic factors in n. So in other words, they decay exponentially fast with increasing index n. Now, what this means in terms of approximation is that we can approximate f very accurately by just taking its first uh, s coefficients. Okay. So in particular, if I form the polynomial approximation fs, that's a sum from n equals zero to s minus one over its coefficients times the basis functions, then the error of this approximation 
uh, occur, uh, decays uh, geome geometric geometrically fast in S. So essentially, it looks like the exponential of negative gamma times S uh, for any gamma between zero and log rho. So effectively, the, the error goes down like rho to the negative s. So that's the one-dimensional story. The one-dimensional story is very, very classical. Uh, there's nothing, nothing new here uh, in any sense. So now let's suppose we go to d dimensions. Okay? So suppose we work on the, on the unit cube um, in d dimensions. Then the first thing we do is we tensorize our one-dimensional measure. So in particular, we're just going to focus on the, the tensor uniform measure or the tensor arc sine measure. So, and then because we tensorize the measure, we can uh, construct a tensor product orthonormal basis. So we take our one dimensional pro polynomials and we form the tensor products. And this gives us basis functions, phi subscript n, where here now n is a multi-index. Okay. Uh, so uh, I've used bold n in the slides, uh, and the the entries n1, n2, dot 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 through to n n correspond to the the polynomials in in each each of the variables. So this gives us an orthonormal basis uh, over our hypercube, and exactly as in the one dimensional case, uh, any function that's uh, square integrable with respect to our measure has an orthonormal expansion or an orthogonal expansion in this basis. So the same as before, uh, a sum over coefficients times by polynomials, where now we're summing over all multi-indices uh, in, um, uh, in D dimensions. Okay, so now we can, the first thing that we can look to do is to see what, um, how the coefficients behave. Uh, if we assume that F has um, uh, uh, an analytic continuation. So what we do is we now suppose that F has a holomorphic extension to what's called a Bernstein polyellipse. Okay, so Bernstein polyellipse is just a product of one dimensional Bernstein ellipses uh, in each of the variables. So this is a set that lives in uh, CD uh, and it's defined by a vector parameter, bold rho, where the, the components of rho um, correspond to the Bernstein ellipse in the corresponding variable. So rho one here corresponds to the variable y one, et cetera, et cetera. So then what you can show is that if F satisfies this assumption, then essentially just by working by induction on the one dimensional case, you can show that its coefficients behave like rho to the negative n uh, up to a factor that's algebraically growing in n here. Okay. Where rho to the negative n here is um, uh, some standard multi index notation, it's just the product of rho j to the negative nj from j equals 1 to d. Okay, so now we can ask the question, um, how do we approximate our function? Okay. So we're interested in approximating F uh, using S terms from, um, from this expansion here. So in other words, we're interested in, in approximating F by something like Fs here, where our, our multi-indices are taken from S. So in the one dimensional case, we, 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 just, uh, we took S to be the first little S indices. Um, but now in the d-dimensional case, it's not quite clear which S indices we should choose. So, at least from a theoretical perspective, though, there's a, there's a straightforward answer. Okay. Um, we know via Parseval's identity that the error is going to be, in the two norm squared, is going to be the sum over the coefficients that we're, that we're not including in our approximation. So therefore, if we want to get the best approximation, we should let capital S be the set of multi-indices corresponding to the S largest coefficients in absolute value. If we do that, then the approximation that we get is known as what's called the best S term approximation. 
So visually, how, how we generate this approximation is, is, is the following. So you take your coefficients here. Uh, so these are just ordered in, in a standard lexicographic way. You look for the S largest. Um, so here, I, I guess uh, I've taken 160 something coefficients in total and I'm taking S to be 10% of that, so around 16. You take the S largest and those form the indices of your approximation. Another way of saying this is you take your coefficients, you sort them into non-increasing order, and then you take the first S of those. Okay, so um, the, the best S term approximation is a, is a classical object in, in nonlinear approximation theory, which is as a field really goes back to the, the 1980s or before. Um, I was really developed in the early, uh, late 80s, early 1990s. Um, but then uh, it was only more recently that people started to look at best S term approximation in the context of polynomial approximations of uh, analytic functions. And again, this was all this was done uh, through the sort of works of um, uh, Cohen, Devore, and Schwab, uh, and various others. And this all started around ten years ago, and now we have a fairly good understanding of how these approximations behave. So the first thing you can do is you can prove uh, exponential convergence rates for the best S term approximation. So you can prove something like this. Uh, I won't go into the details. The point is, is you get a rate that's the exponential of negative gamma for some gamma, depending on your rho j, times s to the 1 over d. Um, so this essentially, this exponential rate is essentially the direct generalization of the, the classical one-dimensional result. But it turns out because of the, the d dependence here that this result is is not very suited in, in sort of very high dimensions. Um, so in high dimensions, um, or in, in fact, in infinite dimensions as well, you can show algebraic rates of convergence um, that are independent of D. So you can show rates that look like something like this, um, where the area is decaying algebraically in S. Uh, and these subject to some assumptions on your row, um, so the regions in which you're, you're holomorphic, you, these rates also extend to the infinite dimensional setting as well. Okay, so that's, that's a sort of background polynomial approximation theory. Um, now I wanna talk about how we actually construct these approximations. So the first thing to point out is that the best S term approximation is, is a completely theoretical object. Um, you can think of it as essentially as a best, uh, as a benchmark. Okay? Um, if I'm allowed to, to compute S coefficients and I know which ones to, com to compute, then this is the best approximation that I can achieve. Um, now in practice, trying to compute the best S term approximation is a seemingly quite daunting thing to do. Uh, um, seemingly, it requires us to compute all the coefficients, of which there are infinitely many, uh, and then sort them. So in other words, search over infinitely many multi-indices and order the coefficients and then take the largest S. So this already looks intractable. And then we have to keep in mind that in practice, the problem that we're trying to solve is to approximate our function from a limited number and a particular finite number of sample values. So it's not really possible to compute the best S term approximation, um, but we can ask the following question. Can we, are there approximations that we can compute from our sample values uh, that achieve similar rates of convergence? Um, and ideally where the number of samples that we need scales mildly with, with S. Okay. So this, this is in other words saying that we have mild sample complexity. So again, starting about, about 10 or 15 years ago, people started to think, how should we do this? And there are a number of different approaches um, that were relatively popular in the literature. Um, one is to, first of all, one is to, if you have any a priori information on your coefficient, you can use that to try and build good index sets. Um, but these are often not, not something that you have in practice. Uh, the second thing that you can do is try and do some kind of a posteriori analysis. Um, this turns out to be quite expensive and also quite sensitive. Um, 
and then the sort of third class of methods that people have, have, have looked at quite a lot is to use essentially greedy adaptive methods to iteratively build up an index set. Um, so these third class of methods are quite popular and, and work reason, reasonably well in practice, but they've, they really lack any kind of theoretical guarantees, um, which is problematic. So I'm not going to talk about these three approaches here. What I'm going to talk about is sort of the, the sort of more recent ideas, which is to incorporate techniques from compressed sensing. And this started around 10 years ago. So first of all, just, just one quick slide on, on compressed sensing. So I, I imagine sort of many of you in the audience have, have um, heard a lot about compressed sensing in the past. So I'm not going to go too much into the details, but let me just sort of remind you, ooh, sorry, let me remind you of the sort of main ideas. Um, so compressed sensing is, is all about how to recover a sparse solution of an underdetermined linear system of equations. So I have something like this. I have a sparse vector. So a sparse vector is a vector where most of the entries are zero. Uh, and I have a small number of non-zero entries. Uh, and I have an underdetermined linear system. So I have um, uh, fewer rows than columns. And the idea is given A and given B, recover the vector X. So of course, in general, this is impossible, but if I impose sparsity, because so it's generally impossible because I have infinitely many solutions of an underdetermined linear system of equations. Um, but if I impose sparsity, then my hope is that I, I, um, I limit my degrees of freedom sufficiently that I can recover my, the, the vector, the, the, the true sparse vector. So I won't go into detail on how, much, how one does this in practice, there are various different ways, but a standard approach is to solve a minim L1 minimization problem. So in other words, find uh, the solution of the linear system that has the uh, smallest L1 norm. And it turns out that for um, uh, both theoretical and, um, and geometric reasons, uh, under suitable conditions on A, um, this will exactly recover the sparse vector. Of solving this problem will exactly recover this sparse vector. Okay, so um, as I said, about 10 years ago, people started to use compressed sensing to do polynomial approximation in high dimensions. And the, the sort of standard setup is, is to proceed as follows. So first of all, we have to say how we're going to choose our samples. Uh, and the standard thing to do is to use Monte Carlo sampling. So there are two, essentially two rationales for this. Uh, one is the sort of general rationale that we know that Monte Carlo samples are good for uh, high dimensional problems. So of course, this is why this is the basis for Monte Carlo integration. The second rationale is that we, we essentially know in compressed sensing that um, in order to, to say something meaningful about when we can recover, uh, we need our matrix A here to, to have some randomness in it. Okay, so this is a convenient way to give us uh, a random matrix when we, when we reduce to the compressed sensing problem. Okay, so that's the first step. So then the second step is we, we need to do some kind of truncation. Uh, so we have a function f that typically has an infinite expansion. So it's an expansion over all multi-indices. And obviously to formulate things as a finite linear system of equations, we need to truncate this in, in some way. So we pick an index set lambda uh, of size capital N, which is typically much bigger than our number of samples. Uh, we truncate the expansion uh, using the, the indices in lambda. Once we do this, we can now form an underdetermined linear system of equations. So we take our basis functions, we order them in some way, uh, and then we set up the matrix, which is just basis functions evaluated at sample points. That gives us our matrix A. Our right-hand side is our um, function value. So these are our samples of F. And now we solve an L1 minimization problem for the coefficients. So we minimize the norm of the coefficients subject to fitting our function samples. Um, and normally what we do is we add in some error here. So some eta, which accounts uh, for the fact that we did, a, we did a truncation here and also accounts for the fact that in practice, we might have noise in our measurements. Okay. 
So then this is our basic approximation. So we find an approximation f hat, which is a sum over coefficients, where the coefficients are the, uh, have the minimal L1 norm over all vectors that fit our data, our samples of f up to some error eta. Okay, um, so as I said, this is, um, people have been doing this for, for over a decade. Um, uh, I won't go into sort of all, all the contributions. There's been a lot of work on applying this to PDEs. There are a lot of work on extensions um, and, and generalizations of this approach is quite well understood now. And it's been used fairly successfully to, to solve parametric model problems in high dimensions. So we started to look at, at this around 20, um, uh, 2014. Um, and there were a number of problems that we, we sort of identified and what have been done to this point. Um, so the initial works in, in this field were sort of very influential in sort of launching this, uh, this new set of techniques, but there were some issues with the, um, or some key issues with how, how this was done. Um, so the first issue is that the sample complexity estimates were generally suffered from a curse of dimensionality. So in other words, they, um, for, in the Chebyshev case, they, they look like two to the D times S and in the Legendre case, they could actually be a lot worse than this. And of course, this is undesirable if you're working in high dimensions. Um, I talked about this truncation, um, but there was really no clear way in which to perform this truncation. No, no clear guidance on how to choose the truncated set. Um, there is an issue with this fitting parameter eta uh, and that it's not clear how to fit this. Um, and there, there weren't any real results that connected um, what, uh, what the, um, how the approximation, how well the approximation actually uh, approximated holomorphic functions. Okay, whether, so the question is about, can we achieve exponential rates of convergence were unresolved. Okay, and then there are a couple of other challenges, which I think I won't discuss in, in, in any detail because I'm running a little bit behind time. So, okay, so um, the first thing we looked at was how to address these two problems here. Um, and essentially the first problem arises because recovering, approximating coefficients CN um, corresponding to large indices requires more samples. Uh, so if you have a coefficient uh, corresponding to a, a large multi-index, you need more samples to approximate it, essentially. Fortunately, it turns out that you don't actually need that many uh, coefficients corresponding to large indices. So it turns out that what you can do is you can limit yourself to thinking about lower sets of multi-indices. So a set of multi-indices is lower if um, whenever you have an n in your index set, you also have every n prime uh, in your index set that's uh, component-wise less than or equal to n. So think of a lower set as something like this. Uh, for every index here, uh, I have everything in the, in the rectangle below it, which is what this component-wise inequality is saying. Same for this index here, I have everything in the, in the rectangle um, between it and the origin. On the other hand, this set is not lower because I have this gap here, and this set is not lower because I have this hole here. And so the key insight is that um, we can limit ourselves to thinking about lower sets in practice. So in particular, we lose nothing if we look at best S term approximations in lower sets. Okay? The, the same rates can be shown uh, when you limit your approximation to taking coefficients in, in certain lower sets. Okay. So then, um, so this, these are approximation theoretic results. These were known before we started working on this. And then the question is, well, how do you promote this kind of lower set structure? Uh, and the idea that we came up with was actually a, a fairly straightforward idea uh, is to use weights. So in other words, rather than minimizing the L1 norm, you should minimize a weighted L1 norm. Yeah. The idea being is that if you have rate weights that grow with your indices, these will penalize you from having very large uh, indices at very high 
um, oh, sorry, coefficients have very high indices in your approximation. So that's how we how we're able to to promote lower set structure. And then if we think about lower set structure as well, this also gives us a concrete way of choosing our truncation set. So if we limit ourselves to thinking about um, approximations and lower sets, then immediately we can choose our truncated index set to be the union of all lower sets, okay? Because we're only interested in recovering lower sets or approximations in lower sets. Therefore, lambda just needs to contain all lower sets of a given size. And it turns out that this is a finite index set and it's what's known as the hyperbolic cross index set, okay? Which if you know, are familiar with high dimensional approximation, this is a sort of familiar index set to you. Okay, so then the, the sort of key result that we're able to prove if we, when we, when we do this is that um, we get recovery um, with a sample complexity now that's uh, only logarithmically dependent on dimension. So the trade-off is that we get some polynomial growth in S uh, depending on whether we work with Chebyshev or Legendre polynomials, but now we have a much better scaling with respect to D. Okay. So uh, I won't go into the details of this, this theorem here uh, and certainly not how we prove it, um, but let me say lo lower set structure is very important for this result. Um, it, it's what facilitates here getting an algebraic scaling in S um, and only a logarithmic scaling in the dimension. So essentially in terms of sample complexity, we can, if we, if we switch to, to this weighted R1 minimization, we can uh, overcome the curse of dimensionality in our sample complexity, at least up to this logarithmic factor in D. Okay, so I think, um, let me uh, say, so we, we uh, I'll skip through this quickly. Um, so we can also, um, we also managed to resolve how you set your optimization parameter in practice. Um, and then more recently, we've been able to show that we can achieve algebraic and exponential rates. So informally, if we have a holomorphic function, um, then we can achieve an approximation error that's uh, either exponential with respect to the number of samples up to logarithmic factors um, or algebraic um, in our number of samples, again, with, uh, um, uh, with, with uh, logarithmic factors. Uh, and I should say the second result here also holds in infinite dimensions as well. Let me also um, skip the, the sort of last two problems. So everything I've talked about can, can be extended to the Hilbert value case. And we can also talk about uh, actual algorithms for, for solving these optimization problems as well. Okay, so to, to just summarize this, um, this first part of the talk. Um, so what we've been able to do through this, this, this work is, is to come up with sort of provably efficient algorithms for approximating high dimensional holomorphic and Hilbert value functions with rates of convergence that are the same as the best test time approximation. So essentially these, the approximations that we, we can obtain through these algorithms are essentially near best. Um, so the sort of takeaway is that this, this, using these compressed sensing ideas to compute polynomial approximations is useful. Uh, I haven't talked about, about practical parametric problems, but there's a lot of work on that as well. Uh, and we, we have a pretty complete theory of how to do this as well. There are lots of extensions, which I, I won't say anything about um, in, in terms of how you do the sampling, uh, better sparse recovery, how you work with, with non-tensorial domains, how you work with corrupted data, gradient augmented measurements, et cetera, et cetera. And, and three of my students have done a lot of work on these extensions as well. Okay, but what I want to do in the last uh, five minutes or so is to talk about, uh, is to switch gears and talk about uh, neural networks. So um, we, we know that, um, I, well, I think everyone in the audience will be aware that in the sort of last uh, three or four years, um, deep learning has begun to be very actively applied to, to scientific computing problems, whether it's in numerical PDEs uh, or in things like discovering dynamics uh, or on inverse problems, particular inverse problems in imaging. So what uh, my, my postdoc Nick and I started to ask a few years ago was 
the following question uh, or a broad question. So to what extent is deep learning useful for these high dimensional parametric PDE problems? Uh, in particular, can it overcome some of the limitations of polynomial based methods? So I haven't talked about these limitations in much detail, but polynomial based methods uh, do suffer from a high computational cost. They are not good with problems with sharp interfaces and they're certainly not good for uh, problems that have discontinuities in the parametric domain or in general they're not good for problems where the, the parametric dependence is not really axis aligned in a certain sense. So the first thing that we we sort of when we started uh, thinking about this is we you know we we thought well the re there are reasons to be optimistic uh, about using de deep neural networks instead. Um, so there is a growing and or a large and growing literature on deep neural network approximation theory. Uh, and this tells us that deep neural networks are extremely expressible. Uh, deep neural networks are, or are extremely good at approximating functions from various different function classes. And in particular for holomorphic functions, there's a series of recent results, including some of our own, that, that tell you that there exist deep neural networks of given size and depth that can achieve the same sort of algebraic and exponential rates of approximation as uh, the best test term polynomial approximation. So in other words, there exist neural networks that can do at least as well as polynomial best polynomial approximations. On the other hand, um, these results are effectively existence theorems. Uh, they tell us that there exists a deep neural network uh, of a given architecture attaining a certain error, but they say nothing about how we actually learn this from training data. And in particular, they say nothing about the amount of training data that one needs to do this. And of course, this is, these are important questions, in particular, the amount of training data that we need, because in the problems that I'm focusing on in this talk, we're typically very data starved. Okay? We don't have the sort of abundance of data that you might have in an image classification problem, for instance. Okay? We are uh, dealing with much smaller, order of magnitude, smaller amounts of data in practice. Okay, so um, as I said, so when Nick uh, joined me as a postdoc uh, a number of years ago, this is um, what he started to investigate first. Uh, and he has a, a, a framework uh, which is on his GitHub page uh, called Machine Learning Function Approximation, which is a numerical framework for investigating the practical performance of deep learning uh, on function approximation tasks uh, in a, framed in, in, in terms of numerical analysis. Uh, and the basis for this is a, is a paper that was just published in, in Science Journal of Mathematics and Data Science. Um, which goes into a lot of these details, in particular, a lot of algorithmic details as well. Um, let me just give you a couple of highlights from the, this paper. Um, so um, the, the sort of, the, the first thing is that the, the, the performance of, of, of standard deep neural networks trained using standard ways with standard architectures is, is often quite, quite limited. So, this is a smooth function approximation problem. Um, when you use shallow networks, they, they really struggle to perform on this problem. You can get somewhat competitive performance against polynomial methods uh, if, you, if you work with sort of deeper and wider networks. Um, having said that, there's, a, there's obviously a, a, a key trade-off between your architecture size and your number of samples uh, and the function you're trying to approximate. And, Balancing how you set the architecture size with the number of samples and the function you're trying to approximate is a very delicate task in practice. Um, if you go to higher dimensions, uh, rather interestingly, deep neural networks can really suffer very badly from the cursor dimension on some functions. So here's a very smooth function in, in eight, eight dimensions, I believe. Um, these are the polynomial approximations, these are the various deep neural network approximations. This is a very smooth function, so it's not surprising that the polynomial approximations do very well here. Um, however, what we should keep in mind is that there are deep neural networks that can achieve this, this error. Uh, but what we're obtaining through training gives us a much, much worse error. 
On the other hand, if we go to a, a more complicated but still smooth function to higher dimensions, we can actually see better performance of, of, of deep neural networks over um, uh, polynomial methods, at least when we're in the sort of larger number of samples regime. The other thing you can do is you can play around with different architecture sizes. And again, you can see here that changing your depth and your width uh, can give you better or worse results. And how you optimally choose these is, is not clear in advance. Um, let me uh, let me sort of skip that. So, um, so the sort of takeaway from this from this work is that um, that there's a there's a sort of key gap between the approximation theory of deep neural networks and their practical performance on on in particular smooth function approximation tasks when trained from limited amounts of data. Um, so that was the sort of the sort of negative conclusion from our paper, uh, and then we started to think, well, okay, well, what can we do? Can we can we improve things? Um, and the sort of conclusion is that the 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 only way that you can you can improve things is by changing the the architecture and changing how you train. Okay. Um, now, on the one hand, at least in terms of theoretical insights. Um, there are upper bounds that show you that there, that this gap must persist in a theoretical sense. So there's a recent paper by, by Gross and Voigtlander that says that there are classes of functions that are well approximated by DNNs of, of a certain size, but which require uh, lots of training data to learn. So in other words, you can have good DNN approximations, but never be able to, be, to learn them in practice. So we, we looked at this and we thought, well, this is um, this is sort of not what we're not not great. Um, can we have lower bounds? Can we show that there are ways of training DNNs that perform at least as well as our current state of the art techniques? And so, just to to finish today, let me let me end with a sort of informal theorem that says that uh, which we like to call a practical DNN existence theorem, uh, and this says that there are there is a deep neural network architecture. There is a training procedure and there's a choice of sample points for which any DNN that we, we obtain through this procedure achieves the same approximation error as compressed sensing based polynomial methods for holomorphic high dimensional Hilbert valued function approximation. Moreover, the training can be done efficiently as well. So this basically says that we, we can, uh, at least in theory, do at least as well as our current state of the art techniques. The caveat is you can't just go and implement, uh, or you could go and implement this procedure, but in practice, it, it wouldn't perform any better than, than polynomial based methods because the way in which we prove this theorem is to element, uh, emulate a polynomial method as a deep neural network training procedure. Nevertheless, once you, uh, once you actually start to look at parametric PDEs and you start to tune your architecture uh, in ways that sort of Nick and I have laid out in, in our paper uh, and in also more recent work with, with Sebastian as well, we can start to see for parametric PDEs, we can start to see benefits of deep neural network methods over polynomial approximations. Okay, so I'm, I'm sort of out of time uh, and I, I've gone quite quickly. Um, so let me just very briefly conclude. Um, so compressed sensing based polynomial methods have, have proved pretty useful for high dimensional tasks, uh, in, in, in particular involving parametric PDEs. Um, what we've done is we've shown that we can, that there are efficient ways of, of implementing these procedures that come with full theoretical guarantees for, for holomorphic high dimensional and, and also Hilbert value functions. Um, in the last couple of years though, people have started to, to investigate deep neural networks um for these types of problems and sort of what we've we've shown is on the one hand that uh, doing this is very is challenging it's challenging to to set up an architecture and a training procedure to give um good performance um however we've also shown that there are provably good ways of doing this and if you if you can uh tune your your architecture or develop good architectures uh, and good training strategies then you can outperform the sort of current state-of-the-art methods. So let me end there with, uh, and thank you. Uh, sorry for going a little bit over time, uh, and I'm happy to take any questions that you have. Thanks a lot, Ben, for this interesting talk. Are, are there any questions? 
any questions from the audience? Hi, Ben. Yeah, I do have a, uh, two questions. One, one is maybe a, a bit naive question. Um, for the when you were talking about. Could I ask a question? Oh, Hello? sorry. Uh, yeah, um, maybe uh, one one after another. Maybe uh, Indy uh, first ask his question, and then uh, Roman, you can ask a question. Sure. Uh, yeah. So, so uh, my, my question is uh, oh. uh, that uh, it, what is the chance that uh, it will be uh, understood uh, the, uh, how we can uh, make good approximation uh, using deep learning? Uh, sorry, I'm I'm not quite sure I understand your question. Uh, so, so because you, you show that uh, uh, what exists uh, approximation, yeah, mm -hmm. but it is not clear how to do this, yeah, still. So uh, is uh, there hope that it is uh, maybe will be possible to do in the future? So okay, so um, so let me just. Uh, I, went, I went through this quite quickly, so let me um, just uh, uh, back up a little bit. So the um, so a, a couple of years, years ago, people proved that there for holomorphic functions, there exists um, a deep neural network of a given size and depth um, that achieves the same algebraic and exponential error rates as the best S term approximation. So somehow this um, this deep neural network, the size of the network in terms of the number of non-zero weights and biases is, is something like S log S and it achieves an error that's um, you know, uh, exponentially small in S uh, or S to the one over D. So th this was, this showed that these kind of networks exist. Um, and, um, but they don't show any, anything about how, whether you can train them. Um, so what we, shown is a in in this result here is is that you can in fact train a network that does this um so you can you can, there is a a training procedure um that will achieve the same exponential rates um with respect to the number of sample values now the the problem with this is um is is really the same problem with all these dnn existence results so all basically all exist results about the approximation properties of, of deep neural networks um what they do is they 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 take a classical approximation like a polynomial approximation and show that you can write it um or you can approximate it as a deep neural network so these results here um approximate polynomials with deep neural networks uh and that's how they achieve these rates and we do the same thing here so we you know i, I there's no there's no point hiding this. The 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 proof is is emulating compressed sensing with polynomials as a deep neural network training procedure. Uh, it's not straightforward to do this. Uh, there's there's a lot of technical pieces to to get this to correct. But so but we should be clear about what this is saying. I'm I'm not saying that you should implement this because if you implement it, you'll get the same error as 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 compressed sensing. Um, actually, I'm, I'm not even clear if you implement it, it would be numerically stable. Uh, most likely not. Um, so I really view this as a lower bound. Uh, I'm not saying that you should do this in practice. I'm saying that at least you know that if there is a way of setting up your training that it can work as well as, as current schemes. But of course, what we're interested in in practice is doing better. Uh, and I'm, I'm afraid I don't have a, a sort of better answer at the moment of how we um, how we should set up our architecture and, and training procedure, and then how we can guarantee what we've got through that. Uh, all, all we be all we focused on doing at the moment is essentially um, tuning our architectures in the right way to get to get good results. Uh, I, ho I hope that answers your your question. Yes, yeah, thank thank you very much. Yep. Right there, then in, in there, I think you had a question, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Thanks, Ben, for the very nice talk. Um, I still kind of have a maybe naive question and follow up question. Um, I seem to understand Monte Carlo math sampling, um, the you know, various convergence rate in the standard usual integral, estimate integral is like some variance over square root of the number of samples. So, what's the um, 
what, is there like an intuitive reason why for uh, you know function approximation that allows you to sort of improve on that high dimension you know rate yeah, uh, that, um, that you talked about? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, so um, if we if we use Monte Carlo integration to 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 compute the coefficients. So if we if we view those as integrals and then use Monte Carlo integration to compute those, then we would see the Monte Carlo error rate, which is like one over squared m. Mm -hmm. um, but what we we don't do that. So we we just we use this to um, we use this as our sample points, um, and then so okay. So what's the um the let me see if there's a there's a sort of um the sort of well let me start with a sort of slightly more technical reason so the more technical reason is essentially that um you you um I'm trying to think of a good, good intuitive reason for this. So the, um, sorry, <laughs> the, no, 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 no. It's, uh, it's a good question. So, um, uh, the, you, it, at some level, you, you, all you need, um, is so for, so for any, anything like this, what, you, what you really need is you need some kind of um equivalence between your your continuous l2 norm let me um mm -hmm. and a discrete l2 norm over your sample points um mm -hmm. so and um and you need this to be an equivalence over your over the space of polynomials um and um but you you essentially don't need this equivalence to you you just need equivalent an equivalence you don't need a, a sort of good approximation of, of that so um mm. uh the yeah um i'm trying to th i I'm, I'm i'm you've stumped me slightly on a sort of more oh, intuitive explanation no, I, for that, I, I, but I um I, yeah yeah um, um Maybe from from what you just said, uh, like I, I remember, I you know some background in finite element, and you have these inverse inequality, kind of like what you're talking about, equivalence of discrete norms, and then you can pull some rates out of you know by changing the the equivalences. So so maybe something like that, it, the different norms you have allowed to then to have a so, you know, some factor in front, like kind of like that. So if I make a um an analogy. So if I have a, suppose I have a Galerkin scheme for solving a mm -hmm. PDE run. Um, yes. And then suppose I, I take, so I've got a, um, I got a, uh, a variational form on my, um, oh, sorry, I have a sort of an inner product on my left hand side. And then I have something on my right hand side, which is like an inner product as well. If I make the same approximation on both sides, mm -hmm. um, so I replace my, my inner products by quadratures. Um, and I, I use the same thing on both sides, then um, I would not expect to see the quadrature error in my final error bound. If I, if I make the same approximation on both sides, if I make different approximations on, on those sides, then um, I would expect to see a uh, that, that error, that quadrature error coming in. So I we're essentially okay. doing that. Um, I see, okay. Okay. No, thanks, uh, yeah, <laughs> sorry. Uh... Uh, the kind of stuff. Uh, no one has question. I kind of maybe a follow up question. I sure. wonder. Um, so related to the deep uh, neural network part, uh, you show some plots of um, uh, where you have better performance over the classical approaches. Uh, so when you say that, do you mean the rates are the same, right, or is it just a constant that's better? Like um, you know, um, that's. So yeah, good question. So we're, we're always measuring performance in in our work in terms of the uh, the error versus the number of samples. Um, so when I say better performance, I just mean small smaller error. So um, oh, okay, I see. let me so here um, when we so the 
the the solid lines here are polynomial approximations uh mm -hmm. and then here we see the deep neural network approximations they're they're getting sort of uh an accuracy that's about five or ten times better um mm -hmm. at least for sort of larger number of samples so okay yeah but uh, i mean we're not we're not comparing these in terms of cost of computing the approximation not as you as you might imagine computing the dnn approximations is a lot more mm -hmm. uh, a lot more expensive computationally so okay thank you uh, i would also have a question uh, related to this uh, trade of neural networks i think you mentioned somewhere um i guess in your lower bound estimation that you need some sort of normalization also um i think i saw somewhere you have like an l2 sort of a weight decay i think in your informal statement right uh, it's something uh, about the, yeah so minimizing certain regularized l2 loss so one thing that i'm i'm curious about here is so with polynomial interpolation you have the guarantee that you match in fact at least two data points right mm -hmm. For neural networks, you will not match your data points, right? I mean, you have an optimization error, so your neural network interpolant will not pass through your data points exactly, right? Yeah, no, no. I mean, um, uh, yeah. So yeah, we um, in yeah. So it, that's that's true for the neural network approximation it's also true for the polynomial approximations that we we develop so we 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 don't generally come up with schemes that interpolate okay. um, so you actually that that's the first thing we, we we did this for a little bit but um it it turns out to be not um easy to you, you can sort of force interpolation um but then uh it does not give you at least the, the theory it, do, it doesn't quite it doesn't work out you end up with these sort of additional factors that are hard to control and i think in practice as well i'd, I'd have to um uh look look back i think in practice as well it doesn't doesn't work doesn't give you as good approximation as, as schemes that sort of don't don't interpolate so Right. So, I mean, my, my question then, I mean, there is certain fields out, I mean, you didn't talk a lot about application, but so think about, say, you want to just do standard data interpolation, right? Right. Um, and I mean, so you, you can make a case, right, if you do standard data interpolation, say in 2D, 3D, like even polynomial interpolation starts to become I mean, okay, it's not as costly as a neural network, but say for the accuracy that you get, say linear interpolation in 2D, 3D, you, you might come up with the idea, okay, maybe you get better, better results by replacing your polynomial interpolator with a neural network. But then the question is, yeah, okay, if you cannot fit, in fact, your data points exactly, do you see sort of any any sort of application area of these uh, these methods, in fact, to field, say, Think about geophysics, meteorology, where you try to just inter uh, interpolate sparse data. Do you see sort of any application of say deep learning there at all, or do you think that that's going to be hard? Um, I, I guess um, I, I guess the question is how how important it is to interpolate your data. So um, I'm. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, that that would be my question for you. In, the, in these kind of fields, it, it, do people really care to about interpolating the data, or do they? Yeah, just I mean, I think, to... yeah. I mean, I think that's a great question. I mean, I think in I don't know about oil fields, but I think say if you think about meteorology, right? Say you want to interpolate the wind field, or so I guess your wind field, I mean, would come from some sort of reanalysis or like a model. And mm -hmm. would obey certain consistency conditions, right? As I think about say a 2D wind field that should be divergence free. Right. Right. So then the question is so yeah, okay. So even if you don't manage to interpolate sort of your sort of your wind vectors perfectly, your neural network ideally should still also be like divergence free, right? And I think then it like my question then is it is that something that's feasible, right? So it, I mean I guess it depends on how you train these things. 
but I guess like the, the question is, yeah, okay, if there is certain conditions that your neural network should obey, which basically are like given from your data baked in, right? Like the reanalysis field being right. completely convergence free, for example, can you at least sort of accomplish stuff like this, right? Um short answer is I'm I'm not sure. We could um so we could probably prove a version of this theorem that said something about interpolation. Um we we would probably it uh we'd we'd lose some control about about rates i think that would be that would be one issue um i would have to think about it further um but then i i, I mean i think um any so you know i i would i think of interpolation right as adding some kind of in equality constraint to your optimization scheme right um or your training problem and um then you, you know, you never solve this as exactly. Mm -hmm. um, so I, and it, I mean, this is also the same with, with these compressed sensing schemes, right? So if you, if, if we go back here to the, um, this problem here, um, I, you, then you, you implement, you use some optimization solver to solve this. Um, Many of them will not enforce this constraint. They will not give exactly feasible um, sol uh, solutions, or they won't give feasible iterates. So, even if I say, "Okay, I'm going to solve this," um, I, I have to be very careful about how I solve it to get things that are that are feasible. So, um, and I, I view the neural network thing as somewhat similar. That you would have to try and uh, have a training scheme that would give you give you feasible solutions at each each step which might not be easy so. yeah but it, it's a good question it's a great question i i we first started to to look at interpolation uh which is the first certainly the first thing i did in this and it, it, it um yeah there, there were some challenges uh in trying to trying to do that so Oh, uh, I think. Oh, uh, I think I lost you there for a second. Oh, okay. Can can you hear me again? Yes. Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay. Awesome. Um, yeah, I think if there is uh, no more questions, then thank you, thank you for coming and uh, giving a, a nice talk in our seminar. Um, and um, yeah, I think that's that's it from from my side. Yeah. Uh, well. Well. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks again for the invitation. Uh, it's nice to to connect uh, remotely. Uh, and yeah, I hope. I, well, I hope we'll catch up again in in person, maybe next summer at uh, either CMS or Canes. Awesome. Yeah. Looking forward to that. Great. Thanks again. Thanks right. everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye now.